Dear learners, I am going to discuss the most important concepts related to any instrument or measuring system in this part of the lecture. Any instrument or system in the whole world has two types of characteristics namely the static characteristics and dynamic characteristics. Whenever something in this whole wild world is given some input, it takes some time to reach the corresponding output. For example, if you apply a force on a ball placed at a level ground, it will start rolling for some time before reaching a new final location. So, the characteristics any instrument or a system shows right after the application of the input and before settling to a final output are called dynamic characteristics. They got this name from the fact that in this period the output is dynamic. It is changing. Similarly, once the output has settled to a final output and have become static, the characteristics at this point are called static characteristics. While choosing an instrument, both characteristics are equally important, but it depends on the situation and the application that which characteristics are more important. For example, if you are monitoring your body temperature using a mercury in glass thermometer, then the dynamic characteristics doesn't matter a lot as far as the final output is reliable enough. Now consider that this temperature sensor is used to monitor temperature of some chemical in a pharmaceutical company. In such a case, the accuracy of the final output is much more important than the case where you were measuring your body temperature. Therefore, analysis and requirement of the application will dictate the dynamic and static characteristics of the instruments to be used. In this lecture or in this part of the lecture, I am going to limit my discussion to static characteristics only. The characteristics that I'll be discussing are accuracy, sensitivity, linearity, and few more. The first and probably the most important characteristic any instrument has is its accuracy. Accuracy is a measure of how close the output of the instrument is to the actual true output. For example, if your true weight is 80 kg, and the weighing scale you are using is giving you 78 kg, then you can say that there is an inaccuracy of 2 kg in the output. Normally, this inaccuracy is stated in form of a percentage of full scale weight. For example, for a pressure gauge having a range of 0 to 10 bars may have a quoted inaccuracy of 1% full scale. So, what will be 1% of full scale? As full scale is 10 bars, 1% of 10 is 0.1 bar. Therefore, whatever output this pressure gauge is providing, you should expect a minimum error of 0.1 bar in it. This 0.1 bar can be on either side. That's why plus minus 0.1 bar or plus minus 1% of full scale is a better way to state the inaccuracy. So I hope you can figure out the percentage error if the same pressure gauge is reading a pressure of 1 bar. The error would be 0.1 bar and hence the percentage error would be 10% because 0.1 bar is 10% of 1. So what's the main point over here? The main point is don't use an instrument having a range of 0 to 10 bars to measure lower pressures because it is going to give you a large error percentage. For measuring pressures around 1 or 2 bars, use the instrument having full range of 2 or 3 bars maximum. I would like to mention over here that sometimes in place of inaccuracy, a tolerance value is quoted. Tolerance means the maximum error that is expected in any value. Although it is generally fine to use tolerance value, but more specifically, tolerance describe maximum deviation of a manufactured or machined part from the required value. So this term migrated from mechanical side of the industry where parts were machined and tolerance was mentioned, meaning that this machine component has this much tolerance to deviate from the required dimension. 
the next important characteristic that I am going to talk about is precision. Precision means to be precise and to being precise means how much deviation is there in the output when the system is operated again and again. To clarify this point, let's take a simple example of your handwriting. Can you write letter A again and again that looks exactly similar? If you write letter A 50 times, then the more variations you have in your writing style, the less precise you will be called. However, if you can produce exactly same handwriting every time, then you will be called precise. Now let's take another more engineering related example. Let's suppose you have developed a simple weighing machine to measure your weight. The first time you stand on it, it gives you a reading of 85 kg. You step down and then stand on it again. This time it gives you a reading of 84 kg. You repeat this stepping down and standing on for five times and the values you get are 85. Let me write those values down. Uh, for example, 85, 84, 85 once again. 86 and then 84 at the end. A friend of yours also has developed his own weighing machine and asks you to stand on it. You repeat the same procedure as you did for your weighing machine, that is, stand on it and step down five times. The readings you get from your friend machines are, for example, uh, 82, 84, 80, then 85 maybe, and then 83. You'll definitely say that, what is that? You can now deduce two results for sure. The first result is that your machine is more precise or it has higher precision. And why is that so? Because the output of your machine deviated lesser for the same input as your friend's machine. Another result you can infer is that accuracy has nothing to do with precision. Maybe your machine is more accurate than your friends or it may be the opposite case. Accuracy can only be defined if you know for sure that what your true weight is. Therefore, being accurate is something else and being precise is a totally different thing. You can get low accuracy from high precision instruments and vice versa. Lower accuracy is normally attributed to some constant error in the measurement process. However, lower precision is a much more dangerous thing. These figures explain this concept through another example. Let's suppose you want to hit the bullseye. So the accurate and precise hitting would be something like this, whereas precise but not accurate throwing is shown over here. Note that this kind of problem can be solved relatively easily by adjusting the bias present in the system. This image shows an accurate yet imprecise hitting and lastly this one shows inaccurate and imprecise hitting by someone like me. Precision can further be expressed in two different ways, that is repeatability and reproducibility. Both of these terms have totally different definitions. Repeatability means to produce same result for the same input being applied for multiple times in constant conditions. This means if you are using an instrument again and again to measure something, then make sure the environmental conditions are kept constant. That is, the temperature of the environment, pressure, wind speed, humidity, and any other factor that may influence the output of the instrument that is kept constant. On the contrary, reproducibility means being able to generate same precise output no matter how much environmental conditions have changed. Now, this is a tough thing. Normally, instruments have higher repeatability but not higher reproducibility. So for an instrument having higher reproducibility value, the output of the measured quantity will not change whether you are using that equipment in hot and humid environment or on a dry and cold environment. You can also say that reproducibility points towards the ability of the instrument to reject or resist 
any environmental effect. After this, let's talk about a relatively simpler static characteristic, that is range or span. It defines the range of values an instrument can measure with stated accuracy and precision under stated environmental conditions. If you deviate from the environmental conditions, then the range may vary. Or if you try to go beyond the range, you may not get the accuracy and precision that has been stated, or you may even end up damaging the instrument. Moving on brings us to the discussion of linearity. Linearity, as far as the instruments are concerned, means that as the physical quantity that is being measured varies, the output of the instrument should vary linearly. You might have observed on analog kitchen scales, if you have used one, that if you place a small weight, the pointer moves a little. And if you double the weight, the movement of the pointer is now more than before. This signifies that the pointer is not moving linearly as we are increasing the weight. A small amount of non-linearity is not an issue, however, for indicating instruments, linearity is of prime importance because human observers are more comfortable in noting down linear changes. As far as automatic feedback systems are concerned, non-linearity doesn't pose a greater threat as you can easily code the non-linearity present in the incoming signal and the controller will automatically take care of it. In the graph shown, the instrument is linear because the best fit line has a constant gradient. The readings, however, are not all lying on the same line. This deviation in readings is because of precision characteristics of the instrument, or if a human observer was involved, then this is due to a human error as well. The next static characteristic that may be derived from the same graph, that is sensitivity of measurement or simply sensitivity. Sensitivity means how much the output changes for a unit input. For example, if you have a sensitive friend, then a simple situation might have a huge impact on him. And you might end up saying to him that why are you being so sensitive? On the contrary, there might be someone who doesn't get moved by even a huge incident. Then you may call him an insensitive person. Being sensitive and insensitive has its own pros and cons. And same goes for the instruments as well. A sensitive instrument will show a large change in the output for a small input, whereas an insensitive instrument will show a smaller change in the output for the same input. Technically, the gradient of the output versus input graph for an instrument represents sensitivity. Therefore, for a pressure sensor showing a 10 degrees change in the position of the pointer for two bars change in the input pressure, the sensitivity would be 5 degrees per bar. Because for every bar, the pointer is changing 5 degrees and for two bars, it's changed by 10 degrees. Can you determine the measurement sensitivity of the instrument? whose change in resistance with respect to change in temperature is shown. The first thing you need is an output versus input relation. This relation may be established via best fit line on the output versus input graph. However, in this simple case, you can see that for every 30 degree change in temperature, the resistance is changing by 7 ohm. So, you don't need a best fit line in this case as all the points are going to lie on the same straight line. However, if this wasn't the case, then you should first draw the best fit line and then proceed with figuring out the gradient. So in this case, the gradient would be 7 over 30 ohms per degree Celsius. And that would be the measurement sensitivity, which means that for every 30 degree temperature change, the resistance is going to change by 7 ohms. This value can be found in the data sheet of any instrument and you can easily figure out the amount of change in output the instrument is going to show for a change in the input. The next static characteristic is of threshold. 
threshold means a defining point between two states. For example, if someone is being nice to you, but you are constantly nagging and disturbing him, then a point will come when he won't be nice to you anymore and may show anger. He might additionally say to you that I have reached my threshold, signifying that now my behavior is going to change abruptly. Similarly, for instruments, you need to apply a certain magnitude of input before it starts showing you the output. All of you who drive any kind of automobile must have noticed that the pointer of the speedometer doesn't move if you are driving at a very low speed. It abruptly moves to 10 or 15 kilometers per hour once you have achieved that much speed. So the threshold for speedometer is around 10 to 15 kilometers, which means you have to apply this much speed at the input before the speedometer starts giving you some output. Normally, you can find this value written as a percentage of full scale in the datasheet. So, can you figure out the threshold value of a car speedometer in percentage of full scale? If the full scale is from 0 to 220 km per hour and the pointer starts showing the value, for example, in, uh, around 15 km per hour. You can write your answer below in the comment section. Another very important characteristic is of resolution. Simply stated, it is the smallest observable change in the output. For example, if you have placed 20 kg on a bathroom scale, the pointer would be pointing at a particular output. Now let's suppose you add only 100 grams more. Most probably the pointer is not going to show any movement or if it is moved, you won't be able to observe that change. So you might add a little more weight before you can see an appreciable movement of the pointer. Therefore, it depends on the resolution of the instrument that how much input change will cause a change in the output. Furthermore, for analog instruments, a scale is normally provided just as the scale of a weighing machine or the one in your car's speedometer. This scale helps the human observer to read the output to a certain resolution. For example, a car speedometer normally has divisions of 5 km per hour, so you can approximate the speed of the car to the nearest 5 km per hour. Note that this scale is only for your observation. It has nothing to do with the actual resolution of the instrument. A perfectly calibrated instrument has all environmental conditions listed in its datasheet. Therefore, if you use the instrument in those ideal conditions, the instrument will exhibit all stated static characteristics. But it is not always possible to meet the stated environmental conditions. So, how the instrument will behave if you violate the preferred environmental conditions for the use of the instrument? You can relate this situation to your teeth. Normally, you are able to eat anything you wish, but un under certain circumstances, for example, when you are eating ice cream, you might feel sharp pain in your teeth. By the look, there was nothing wrong. So what happened? Why are you feeling this pain? Answer to this is that you are disturbing your teeth by changing the environment from normal to too cold. Your teeth are not in a condition to perform well in too cold environments. However, they are fine in normal situation. Similarly, an instrument might work normally, but if exposed to non-ideal environment, then it may perform differently. Anything that acts as an unwanted input or environment for the instrument is called disturbance. So, when you are going to disturb any instrument, its static characteristics might change. This thing normally happens when you use the instrument at undesired temperatures, humidity levels, and or pressures. So, the measure of magnitude of this change is called sensitivity to disturbance. Normally, 
such exposure to non ideal environmental conditions have long lasting effects on the instrument in form of zero drift or bias and sensitivity drift zero drift or bias is a constant error that is induced in an instrument you can also say that the instrument has a permanent error induced in it for example a weighing scale may always give 2 kg more than the true weight being measured no matter what input is applied to the weighing machine it will add 2 kg in it this error can easily be recognized by removing the input and seeing the output so if at zero input there is some output then that's the zero drift or bias you can easily subtract the zero drift from the final output to get the actual result it's that simple to remove the bias from the instrument this thing is also shown through a graph you can see that the output versus input graph will be shifted because of the zero error this means every output has this much error added to it typically the manufacturer has provided zero drift coefficient in the data sheet that represents the amount of zero drift that may be induced in the instrument if you deviate from the standard operating conditions the second thing that a disturbance typically affect is the sensitivity of the instrument if you can remember sensitivity of the instrument was the change in output for a unit change in the input or the gradient of the output versus input graph exposure to non ideal operating conditions may make the instrument more or less sensitive so if we consider the output versus input graph the gradient of this graph is going to change and the amount of this change is called sensitivity drift that is how much sensitivity has drifted from its actual value let us consolidate on this sensitivity to disturbance concepts through an example this data shows the deflection of a spring balance that you will see if a certain load is applied to it this data is valid for the conditions in which the instrument was calibrated that is at 20 degree celsius but obviously this spring balance will be exposed to different temperatures when being used this data shows the deflection you are getting for particular loads when you use the spring balance at 30 degree celsius so can you figure out the effect of using the instrument in conditions other than the ideal ones particularly can you determine the zero drift and sensitivity drift that has been induced in the instrument so how can we figure out zero drift and sensitivity drift per degree celsius for that the first thing we need is zero drift and sensitivity drift present in the system right now you can see over here for zero drift you can see that at zero input or when you have applied no load there is a deflection of 5 mm so the zero error present in our system right now is 5 mm and what is the sensitivity drift that how much sensitivity has changed if you see the original data the sensitivity over here is 20 mm per kg that is for every change of 1 kg in the input the output is changing by 20 mm and what is the sensitivity over here once again we are changing the input by 1 kg but how much the output is changing the output is changing by 22 mm you can see that 22 mm are again changing over here and the output has changed by 22 mm once again so now we have a sensitivity of 22 mm per kg so what is the sensitivity drift that how much sensitivity has changed sensitivity has changed by 2 mm per kg but the thing is we wanted zero drift and sensitivity drift per degree celsius so this is the zero drift we got after we have deviated from the ideal conditions by 10 degree celsius so what will be the zero drift for 1 degree celsius simply 
it will be 0.5 millimeters per degree Celsius. So this will be the zero drift per degree Celsius. And what about sensitivity drift per degree Celsius? So this much sensitivity has drifted for 10 degrees Celsius. And it is going to be 0.2 millimeters per kg per degree Celsius. Please note the units of sensitivity drift and zero drift per degree Celsius over here. Another static characteristic worth mentioning over here is the hysteresis exhibited by the instrument. Hysteresis means how much effect of the input or output is retained by the instrument. This phenomena can be observed when instruments involving springs or electrical coils are repeatedly used. Springs and electrical coils tend to retain energy, hence allowing the overall output to deviate. You can also relate this effect to the Newton's first law of motion that states that things tend to maintain their states unless acted upon by some external force. This thing is exhibited by the curve shown over here as well. In this area, the instrument is reluctant to show the output even though the input has been applied but the energy storing elements are resisting the change in the output. Same thing can be seen over here that once again the energy storing elements are resisting a change in the output even though the input has reduced. The last static characteristic that I am going to discuss is dead space. The name sounds quite spooky but it is nothing spooky at all. Dead space refers to the range of input values for which there is no output. This is a bit different than the threshold. Threshold are initial values for which the instrument doesn't show any output. However, dead space may occur anywhere in the input range. A very good example of this is a backlash in the normal mechanical gears. Gears that exhibit backlash doesn't show output for few degrees no matter for what, from what position they are being moved. The amount of input consumed in the overcoming of this backlash is completely wasted. So it is aimed that systems should not have backlash but in certain situation for example in case of these mechanical gears it is necessary for the instrument to exhibit backlash. With this, I would like to end this lecture and hope you have understood basic concepts behind various static characteristics of the instruments. So, take care and goodbye.